and welcome back to Bible study as we continue our strength from the sisters. First, let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Parent, we thank you for this day. We invite your presence into Bible study. Show us some nugget maybe that we have forgotten or never knew. Be with us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay. First of all, I have a question I'd like you to think about. Have you ever compared the portion size on your plate with that belonging to someone else at the table, a relative, a friend, or church member in the fellowship hall? If so, what did you say or do? How did you feel about it? Your piece of pie is bigger than mine. Last week, we introduced a sister named Hagar. Our scripture text last week was Genesis 16. And during our introductory comments, we drew a comparison between the TV dramas and biblical narratives. You know, the plot builds up and then you come back week after week or even daily to see what's next. Well, today we're going to continue our focus on Hagar, the Egyptian. So first I want to do a quick recap. Abram and Sarai had no children, no offspring, no biological heir. Sarai gave Hagar, her Egyptian slave girl, as her... Hagar gave... Sarai gave Hagar, her Egyptian slave girl, to her husband, to be his wife and to have offspring through her. So Hagar conceived. Then Sarai got upset with Hagar. Hagar ran away. She fled after being treated harshly by Sarai. So in the desert, a despondent Hagar had an encounter with an angel of the Lord. God had heard Hagar. Hagar was told that her descendants would increase and they would be too numerous to count. And she was told to go back to Sarai. Now that had to be difficult. We don't hear her words, but we do know she went back. And when we ended last week in our text, Hagar had named the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. So in our scripture reading today, we're going to Genesis 21, and we'll be starting at verse 8. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. 
So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Now, much has happened in the chapters between 17 and 21. God has made promises to Abraham about sons. There have been name changes. It's now Abraham and Sarah, Genesis 17, 5 and Genesis 17, 15. There's been a promise in Genesis 17, 16. It's recorded that God says, I will bless her, that Sarah, and surely give you, Abraham, a son by her. A circumcision is recorded in Genesis 1723. Ishmael, Abraham's and Hagar's son, who is 13 years old, is circumcised along with 99 year old Abraham. Now, how about that? Okay, moving on. In the first part of chapter 21, the Lord did for Sarah what the Lord had promised. God blessed Sarah, in her 90s, and Abraham, 100, with a son. So let's go back to chapter 21, and then let's zero in on verse 8. The child grew. The child grew. This verse is not referring to Ishmael, Hagar's son. This verse is referring to Isaac, the son born to Abraham, and to Sarah. Now a celebration is being held. The text reads, on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. Now this celebration marked an important event. Isaac is growing up. Let's look at the significance of weaning in biblical times. Why a celebration? Weaning marked a new stage of life. A weaned child had survived the fragile stage of infancy. This child could now start eating solid food rather than breastfeed from his or her mother. In Hagar part one, we noted that infant mortality was high in ancient cultures. Large families were important because many children did not even live to adulthood. So this is really a joyous occasion for Abraham and Sarah. But now there's a shadowy edge to our narrative. Whenever there's a but, we need to pay attention. Isn't that also the way of dramas on TV? Think about a movie or a TV program. You know, the background music, the score, can alert you to what's going to happen or what might happen. There's a heightened dramatic effect. Think about a Jaws type music. We're warned through the music, the shark is coming or the shark might be coming. You might, want, you might want to get out of the water now. We don't have background music here in the text, but we do have the word, but. Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. Now, what was happening before the but? Let's remember, there was a feast, a grand feast. Prior to the but, a celebration. But actually, the celebration is still taking place, but it's Sarah, Sarah's rather attitude that has changed. She's not in celebration mode. She's angry. Have you noticed how sometimes events can turn on a dime with a spoken word, one glance of the eye, one turn of the head, a laugh, a shrug of the shoulders, a perceived change of status. So 
Here's a question about the tension between Sarah and Hagar. Had that tension been present since Hagar's return from the desert in chapter 16? Or had it just come about in the three years maybe since Isaac's birth? What do you think? Questioning the text even more, I wonder if tension had been building up as Sarah had watched Ishmael, Abraham's son by another woman, just grow up. And had there been tension on Hagar's part as she had watched Sarah's child, Isaac, grow? Again in the text, Hagar's voice is silent, so we don't really know. Questioning the text even more, I wondered why, according to the biblical writer, God would tell Abraham to listen to Sarah. Another question I asked myself, might tension or bitterness have impacted the relationship between these two boys of Abraham? You know, had they sensed the tension or maybe witnessed some actions on the parts of their parents and had that negatively affected their relationship with one another as brothers. What questions might you have of the text? Remember, it's good to ask questions, to be in dialogue with the text. So jot down your I wonder kinds of questions and then you can send them to pastor at, well, okay, let's, let's move on. I'll leave that where that is. Sarah had observed Hagar's son Ishmael mocking, it reads in the New International Version, and playing with her son in the New Revised Standard Version. Either way, Sarah was not pleased with whatever she had observed. Notice in verse 10, Sarah refers to Hagar as that slave woman. Perhaps in her mind, Hagar has been that slave woman even after she had been given to Abraham as a wife. Could it be that once she became upset with Hagar, it was so easy to go into her mental file cabinet to find just the right demeaning word? And that slave woman, that slave woman had just fit perfectly. Sarah's also concerned about inheritance rights. That woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Now, legally, both boys would inherit. But was it the legal inheritance that worried Sarah or God's promises to Abraham or perhaps it was both was Ishmael going to cut into her son Isaac's inheritance from his father and the inheritance from God just asking did Sarah not trust the promise God had already given related to Isaac's future Get rid of her, she says. Get rid of her. Get rid of her, Sarah. That's a little harsh. Now that's me talking back to the text. Think about it. What do we typically get rid of? Well, how about trash? You may want to put some other things in chat you can think of that we get rid of. But think about it, trash. Even trash, we fold up our cartons, we, uh, you know, we have Amazon boxes, we fold them up, we put them in the recycle bin. Clothes, we've outgrown, we think about who might be able to wear them. We fold them up maybe, if we can't think of anybody, and we give them to uh, Goodwill, or we give them to Habitat, uh, Salvation Army, then I thought about ants and roaches and rats and spiders. Now, I think we probably would call an exterminator and say, 
get rid of them. But I tell you, I even know some lovers of those creatures who would never get rid of them. They just try to capture them and then move them to another habitat. I've seen families, blended families, as they're called, and couldn't even tell that there was a step or a half relation. The parental figures um, had been so intentional about creating a loving, unified environment. Unless somebody told you, you'd never know in some families that uh, all the children in the household had not been birthed by the same mother and father. Can you think of families like that? However, you probably know others that mirror the relationship of Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham, filled with tension and drama. Remember our icebreaker question, it was a simple question, about the portion size on your plate compared with that of someone else. Well, perhaps you started comparing, maybe coveting. Um, would you go back and maybe search for an additional piece of cake or pie? Or would you make the decision right then and there that you were going to uh, volunteer for the hospitality committee so you would have better access to the cake and the pies. Satisfaction and joy can flip just like that. Through what lens do we humans look most often? The lens of scarcity or the lens of enough? Here's an example. Let's say healthcare. You may know someone whose position is like this. If all those other people are added to the health care market, I may have too long to see my primary care physician. And what about specialists? I may never get to see a specialist. I may have to wait longer. I, I, I. And what about if I need some rehab? I'll need to wait long for an appointment. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? There's not enough to go around. Or let's say an, another example, no, example two. You have good health care coverage through your employment, or maybe you have Medicare. So you may say, I want others to have the access to quality health care just like I do. You think everyone, just like you, should have um, access to, let's say, routine health care, to be able to purchase prescriptions, to be able to take your medications like the physician prescribed them, not cutting pills and taking one every other day. You say, and your position is, there are enough resources to go around. Sarah is concerned about her son Isaac's future. What happened to her joy over the birth of her son? What about the joy that her son was healthy? In verse 9 we see, But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. I started wondering if Ishmael might just have been annoyed with his uh, little brother. Maybe little brother Isaac had been picking at big brother Ishmael. Or, now here's another thing, maybe could there have been a strained relationship between their mothers and that had rubbed off on these brothers. So, back to our text. A Sarah, rather, had gone to Abraham and complained. Remember, she did the same thing in chapter 16. This time, Sarah demanded that Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael, who's now about 16, to send them away. In verse 11, the biblical text records Abraham's distress over his son Ishmael, but I didn't see any concern on his part for Hagar. So Abraham puts food and water on Hagar's shoulders. 
Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. Now in chapter 16, remember, Hagar had fled. This time in Genesis 21, she's being sent away. She's being pushed out. Picture in your mind's eye, Hagar and Ishmael being pushed out of their home. An eviction of sorts. Hagar and Ishmael wander in the desert. Now imagine if you were picked up right now and dropped in the middle of the Sahara Desert in North Africa. How would you feel and what would you do? Sounds like sobbing time to me. Verse 15, when their water supplies ran out, Hagar put Ishmael under a bush and then she walked away from him. The text says she couldn't bear to watch him die. Hagar cried. Can you picture Hagar, the mother, sobbing for her son? She'd had a desert experience before, but this time her son was with her. Then the text records that God heard the voice of the boy in the New Revised Standard Version and in the New International Version, it reads, God heard the boy crying. Ishmael means God hears. So God hears the cries of Hagar and Ishmael. Similar to chapter 16, an angel of the Lord delivers instructions for Hagar here in Genesis 21. What is the matter, Hagar? What troubles you, Hagar? Notice as before, she's not addressed as slave girl. Again, she's called by her name. Hagar is told again not to fear. And then God opens Hagar's eyes and she sees a well of water. Remember the first time she encountered God through God's messenger? Hagar sees a well she hadn't seen prior. In reading this text, I wondered why she hadn't seen the well. Had she been so distraught that she had overlooked it? Had she been looking totally in another direction? Um, had she not seen it because she'd been blinded by uh, maybe desperation and despondency? Or had the well not been there? Was this a miracle appearance? more questions. So then Hagar fills the skin with water and gives her son a drink. In verse 14, Abraham had given Hagar a skin of water that had lasted. God had given Hagar and her son a well of water and they were saved from death. Now in Genesis 21, 18, God told Hagar, to lift Ishmael and take him by the hand. Contrast that with the image in Genesis 24, 14, and 15. Abraham set them, that is the skin of water and some food, on Hagar's shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. Compare the image of a hand lifting to that of a hand placing a bundle on someone's shoulders, like a beast of bird way down. The Lord had been gracious to Abraham. He had many donkeys and camels. Could he have not placed that food and water on one of those beasts of burden rather than on Hagar's shoulders? Many artists have portrayed portrayed in paintings and prints, Hagar in the wilderness with her son Ishmael. Images of a distraught, suffering mother and son in the desert. You might find it interesting to do a Google search of Hagar in the wilderness and view various artists' representations of this heart-wrenching scene. In the Muslim tradition, 
Hagar has an esteemed position as the mother of Ishmael and the foremother of the Arab followers of Muhammad. Now back to our text. Verse 20 in our text reads, God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother, Hagar, got a wife for him from Egypt. So now we know a little bit more about Hagar. Hagar, the slave girl given as a wife to Abraham. Hagar, mother of Ishmael. Hagar, that slave woman. Hagar, who wandered in the desert. Hagar, a woman who named God. Hagar, a woman who God calls by her name. Hagar, a woman whose eyes are opened by God to see a well of life-giving water in a desert, water that saves her and saves her son. Hagar, a mother who raises a son and finds a wife for him among her people in Egypt. And I imagine she found Ishmael a very good wife in Egypt. Now, I had many more questions about Hagar and Abraham and Sarah and this text. No answers yet, just questions. But I'll share with you a few of my takeaways, places I chose to plant my feet as I read and reread this text and attempted to walk through the wilderness with Hagar. So, on occasion, we, like Hagar, may find ourselves in desert places. But God has promised God's presence. God is with us, God sees us, God hears us, and God knows us by name. And like Hagar, if we look, we'll see God in life-giving provisions such as a spring filled with life-giving water that we didn't even see before. And then we are refreshed. Or perhaps we just open our eyes. We just, perhaps we just need to open our eyes to see what is already around us. Or perhaps we'll behold a miracle. We can extend our hand to lift and we can take hold of the hand that might be extended to us. And like Hagar, we can learn to trust in God's promises, even in a time of COVID-19. And if we want to know more about the God that Hagar met while wandering in the desert, now is a good time. This is as good a time as any to be in Bible study. This is the right place, 31st Street Baptist Church. So this ends our story about Hagar, strength from the sisters. But we don't want to take it for granted that you are here watching us um, and are connected to the God that protects Hagar, um, that God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the God of Sarah, Sarai, and Hagar. And so if you don't yet have a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we want to give you the opportunity uh, to get connected to, this fam to the family of God. And so to do that, um, if you would type connect in the comment section or send us an email at info at 31sbc.org. We'd love to help you to get connected to the family of God, the church universal. But also if you're watching us and you want to be a part of a family, you want to be a part of a local body of believers, uh, we invite you to become a part of 31st Street Baptist Church. I've been saying during this season of pandemic that it doesn't matter where you are. And sure enough, we've had members to join our body, not just in Virginia, but in other states even during this time. Um, um, so we want to make it known that if you're looking for a church to connect with, um, there's no limitation for you. You can be a part of this family. And so we would just invite you to type connect in the comment section 
or send us an email at info at 31sbc.org uh, so that we can connect with you and so that you can become uh, a part of our family through those steps. We're on our prayer line. We're on our prayer line on Thursdays at 12 noon tomorrow. And I want to invite you to be on the line with us tomorrow at 12 noon. You can come in via Zoom, um, via the Zoom information. That same information that we use for the adult class for VBS uh, is available for you. And if you want to dial in, uh, the dial in number is available. It's on the screen, but you can also get that information on our website. If you go to the very bottom of our website, our, our weekly call in number is there um, and the meeting ID number that you will need to get into that. But we invite you to join us in prayer. We had a fantastic uh, experience in prayer last Thursday and we want to continue in prayer each and every week on Thursdays at 12 noon. Um, and I want to also uh, thank all of those who have continued to be faithful in your tithes and in your offerings in this season. It really does go a long way in ensuring that we can do the work of the church and the work of the body of believers through your generosity. You have the opportunity to continue to give. If you're like me, you can give online um, at our church website or through the GiveLify application on your phone. Uh, if you want to give via the mail, you can do that by sending your contributions to 823 North 31st Street, um, Richmond, Virginia, or you can provide uh, your gifts on on Monday through Friday here at the church from 9 a.m. Uh, to 3.30 p.m. or uh, right after our Sunday morning experience from 11.30 to 12.30 p.m. you can give in that way. Church family, I'm so grateful uh, for all that you uh, have done in this season of pandemic. We're grateful for uh, the ways in which you have responded to the call for us to be the church in this season and I look forward to seeing you in prayer, being on the line with you in prayer tomorrow at 12 noon and then of course Sunday morning we're worship at 10.30 a.m. on YouTube, on Facebook, and on our conference call. Until then, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you, give you his peace. Going out and you're coming in and you're laboring in your leisure, in your joy and in your sorrow, and your laughter as well as in that tears until that day where we meet the Lord face to face and cry holy, holy, holy to the Lord of hosts. Until that day, my brothers and sisters go in peace, go in love, go in joy, and may the God of peace, love, and joy, the God of Hagar, may the God of peace, love, and joy go with you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. See you tomorrow at 12 noon, Sunday at 1030 a.m. God bless you.